So hello everyone, my name is Jan Lötfall, I'm professor at University of Gothenburg in Sweden and today uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Professor John Ashton, public health expert from the United Kingdom who's been quite verbal over the last few weeks in the uh, in the field of or discussing COVID-19 responses, especially in the UK, I think, but also looking in, into Sweden. Welcome. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Tell me a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing throughout your life. Oh, well, I'm um, from Liverpool, uh, where I grew up and um, where I have a home today again, but I've been around quite a lot. I went to medical school in Newcastle and have worked at um, in London and in the South and went and did my public health training at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I've worked extensively with the World Health Organization on healthy cities, including in Sweden, over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. I, I advised WHO on the European network of healthy cities. And um, my track record um, of uh, work in public health, particularly uh, working with your colleagues in Sweden on teenage pregnancy issues in the 1980s in Liverpool right. and um, syringe exchange. We introduced the first large scale syringe exchange program in the world in Liverpool uh, in the face of AIDS. And um, these were things I've been associated with. But I, I'm also a psychiatrist originally and a family doctor But before I went into public health. These days I'm serially retired. Um, Seriously, you don't it be retired more than once. I've been I first retired in 2006 um, and then I got dragged back into the county level having done the regional level for 13 years and then I was president of the public health college in the UK for three years and I've just published a new book um, which is uh, practicing public health uh, an eyewitness account Oxford University Press Oh, that's so it's lo lots of stories of uh, and including the collaboration with the Swedes on teenage pregnancy um, and I worked with the Grenfell situation in London on the public health side after the fire in, in Grenfell and then last year I was working with the police and crime commissioner for Liverpool on developing a public health strategy to reduce violence so um, these are my interests so that's a, that's a quite broad um, experience in public health in general. And now we're in a situation where we have a quite severe pandemic going on throughout the world. It seems to have started in China and spread to um, Southeast Asia and the United States, United Kingdom, and, and now, now Europe. And, and you've been quite critical to some of the responses by some of the countries uh, over the last few months. Could you... Talk a little bit about that. Well, I'm, I'm particularly critical of my own country and my own government. You know, we have a very proud public health tradition in the UK. And um, in my own city, we had the first city medical officer, um, full-time city medical officer, uh, William Henry Duncan, who was appointed in 1847. So we have okay. this very proud history of public health. Um, and... Um, so I'm ashamed about uh, how we've performed uh, in this, you know. Um, during my time as a regional director of public health, I had to deal with the, I was involved in the avian flu with collaboration mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. They were working with healthy cities at the time with me. Um, and also, you know, with the SARS and the swine flu. Uh, I was involved um, in deploying the volunteers to go to Sierra Leone in 2014 and to fight with the Ebola. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've had a lot of experience of these things. And, and when we started to uh, face what to do at the end of January and February, it quite quickly became clear that we weren't doing what we should be doing. Um, you know, we tried to test and trace uh, the uh, first people to go down with the virus. We did that, but then we just threw our hands up and gave up and, um, uh, and moved on to these strange tactics, uh, which introduced this discussion about herd immunity and things which we can talk about during the interview. But I, yeah. I became really bothered that we weren't practicing traditional public health 
uh, and that the government advisers seem to be really quite um, complacent or quiet uh, when faced with the politics of it and I weren't really being assertive with the politicians. So yeah, you had a very early case, a business person that picked up the virus in Singapore, right? I read yeah. about that case and this person traveled in Switzerland and Italy, if I remember correctly, and the UK and infected at least 13 different people, if I remember correctly. Well, the early um, experience was, first of all, we had um, British people coming back from Wuhan who'd mm -hmm. been living there and they were put into quarantine uh, in a hospital area just near Liverpool, actually. That was uh, on the 31st of January. Mm -hmm. um, after that, after a couple of weeks, we got the first cases. As you say, there was this businessman who had come back from Thailand, I think, or China, and he'd been skiing. Um, and then he came back to the London area and seems to have infected a number of people there. There'd also been a couple of students who'd returned from China and gone to York University. And that, you know, seems to have been another early uh, contact into the country. So there were a few different uh, yep. indi indi independent cases that started the But the, the big one that I think indicated a real weakness was when we had the, um, the children's school half-term holiday in the middle of February. Mm -hmm. And there were a very large number of parents and families who'd been skiing in Austria and Northern Italy. Yes. And they came back and they weren't screened. <clears throat> Nobody recorded who they were, where they were going. They just went back to their homes. Uh, and I think that must have seeded uh, a lot of the epidemic to come after that in the UK. So that was a major event uh, that r showed up the weakness of the response. And, um, and then there were a number of other things after that, you know, where... We had the football match in Liverpool. Right, I've read about with that, With the yes. Atletico Madrid supporters. That was on the 11th of March. Um, and there were between three and 4,000 Spanish supporters came from Madrid and spent the night in Liverpool. Um, you know, and the advice that the government's advisors gave the government was that really being at a football match wasn't too big a deal. Uh, it wasn't very long. The exposure wasn't very long. I, I was very critical because, you know, really, I think they showed their ignorance of what football culture is. When you've got some thousands of people in the city overnight, they'd be out in the bars drinking and in the restaurants drinking, associating around the ground, the souvenir shop buying kit, souvenir kit and stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of contact time in that 24 hour period. So there's 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 one aspect of the spread that have uh, heard about over the last few days only, and that's screaming creates aerosol droplets that may be easily transmitted. So there's a lot of meat packing spread in the United States. And the one, the one thing they do, it's extremely noisy environment in there. And when they speak to each other, they basically scream in each other's faces. And there's a huge spread within that work environment. Uh, the football matches, what they do, they scream all the time, right? And well, a sting. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether those, um, and the same thing with elderly homes, right? When yes. you have staff, they, they, they are very close uh, in interacting. The, some of the older people have difficulty hearing and you need to be very loud. So... I mean, you're not a virologist, I'm not a virologist, but it's just an observation that I think... Yeah, but, but from, a, were they? from a more general public health point of view, and um, this was something which I pursued in my work uh, during this last three months with Bahrain, because um, I've been advising the Bahrain government, and I've been to Bahrain twice um, at the request of the Crown Prince, who asked me to come and critique what they were doing. Um, and I was able to go around and really forensically examine all the places that might be important. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the hospitals that they were going to use, right. the laboratory, the airport, the seaport, the, the causeway, which links to Saudi Arabia, which has tens of thousands of 
cars and trucks every day mm -hmm. coming in and out and um, also the migrant laborers camps and what we were really trying to do in Bahrain was to say you know this virus is a very clever little virus it's only um, a very simple life form if you can call it that uh, but it'll find the cracks in the system and what we needed to do was to find the cracks in the system so uh, in Bahrain we did that um, I went to the prison um, and as a result of my recommendation um, there they released uh, 900 prisoners early uh, because they got a prison that was overcrowded and it's to reduce the overcrowding so in a, in a general sense uh, settings or environments mm -hmm. that are overcrowded whether it's because of poverty in housing mm -hmm. or whether it's because of the nature of the workplace as you're indicating uh, with the slaughterhouse and meat packing mm -hmm. um, or whether it's a old people's home or prison these are all places that really need to be under the spotlight. Right. Uh, and, and I think we've been slow to put them under the spotlight. And, you, and take the prison example here, you see, I came back from Bahrain and was doing lots of television and radio and I was saying, we need to be looking at the prisons and we need to be thinking about releasing prisoners early if they're coming towards the end of their sentence, like they've done in China and in Iran and uh, in Bahrain. Well, there was a cultural opposition to that in this country. You know, people tend to be quite vindictive about prisoners. And um, although um, there was a decision taken eventually in the UK about releasing, I think, 2,000 prisoners, we have about 90,000 in prison in the UK. Okay. Um, I think only 400 have so far been released. And the number of cases in the prisons now is either one or 2,000 cases in the prison. And there've been, I think, 30 deaths, um, about half prisoners and about half prison officers. So there's a, there's a separate epidemic going on in the prisons, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't really talked about very much. So yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. From a public health uh, perspective, finding the uh, locations, of course, is important, but also influencing people's behavior, I presume, right? Yes, and it's interesting that, you know, yesterday we have now uh, an alternative SAGE group, a uh, scientific advisory group. You know, that, that we mm -hmm. have a scientific advisory group that's been advising government. We now have an alternative scientific advisory group that was set up a couple of weeks ago by the former chief scientist, uh, Sir David King. And he's got 12 people on his group, including four experienced public health people, good colleagues of mine. Mm -hmm. because the actual SAGE doesn't have any experienced public health people on it. Now, they've produced a report uh, yesterday, uh, which I have here for you, um, which you can get off the internet, and um, it's got 18 recommendations in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they really begin to address... This is a really excellent report, uh, and I'd recommend that you... Uh, you know, we could refer to it later, perhaps, but, uh, you know, the, this focusing in on each of these issues that um, mm -hmm. we've started to touch on, including getting to grips with these locations uh, and getting uh, real time data and making sure that the statistics are, are uh, collected to a standard, because at the moment there's a lot of confusion about the statistics. So they've, they've actually spelled out an action plan going forward now. I think you might find this useful in Sweden. Yeah, that sounds good. We're, uh, I, I belong to one of the 22 that wrote a uh, infamous or famous um, debate article in Dagens Nyheter, one of the ma major uh, newspapers here in Sweden. And, um, and, and we do interact still and we do try to find ways of suggesting what is, trying to suggest what is politically correct, but also uh, telling people sometimes you need to think about things that are not politically correct like using a face mask in public yeah. crowded places it's just common sense right well the problem with with i mean it's still not really unambiguous here i mean uh, yesterday the the, the uh, government finally said well you know probably you should wear some kind of face cover if you're going to crowded places which is a very half-hearted kind of endorsement. Mm -hmm. um, but 
the kind of when you say what kind of science is being used to advise government because the mantra here from the beginning has been that the government's saying we're following the science and um you say yes but whose science and which science and how multidisciplinary is this how narrow is this this science but also it seemed as though the scientists who are involved were being lined up so they could be blamed when it went wrong because ultimately these are political decisions that have to be taken on the basis of scientific advice and evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the face mask is a good example because if you go back and read um, uh, James Barry's book uh, on the great pandemic <clears throat> from 1918-19. It's upside down now. You can show it. Uh... Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, if you, the great if you, influencer in 1918. This is a penguin, uh, 2004. Okay. Um, but you know, if you read that, you'll see that they used face masks at that time, and they we used face masks in, in England in Marylebone Hospital in London. The physician superintendent insisted on face masks, they used face masks. Um, we know that people have used face masks in other countries around the world, and um, there's quite a lot of anecdotal evidence that they make an impact. But the kind of scientific standard that seems to have been being applied in the UK seems to be that you need to have a double blind controlled trial and you need to do it in a laboratory and you need to be able to demonstrate whether viruses will pass through the mask and all of this kind of stuff and there's a lack of citizen science and common sense uh, which you know when we were starting the interview and you were sneezing and yeah. uh, saying if you had viral particles then I might well be, have been exposed to a significant viral load if we weren't on Zoom, you know. Exactly. Zoom virus. No, I mean, that, that, and, and if you look at those papers, and I, I, I don't know the whole literature, but I have looked at a number of them, there are a number of, of papers that show significance, uh, and you can criticize their design, you can criticize their statistics, but most studies uh, show tendencies. And then there are papers that don't show significance. And, and you can ask yourself, okay, are those the only one we should look at? Or should we look at the whole picture? And, okay, say that those might, face mask might not be the only solution. It's not going to be the only thing that does it. But it just it's part of the story. It's part, part of the story. story. But I will also say it's a reductionist science which is being offered here. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say no evidence of proof is not evidence of no proof. You That's know? absolutely true. And if you and don't, so some people say you, if you don't have a p-value of 0 0.05, yeah. then it's not proven, right? But if you have a p-value of 0.1, the trend is very strong. Yeah, you have well, maybe. And maybe you need a bigger study or you need something. But in the meantime, and you know, if I, I go back into my public health history, you know, mm -hmm. and you go back into John Snow and the Broad Street Pump in London, the famous story about the cholera in the water supply from the street right. pump, and John Snow taking the handle off the pump and the, you know, the epidemic coming to an end at that point. They reckon it had already peaked, actually, when he took the handle off, but he got the credit. Right. Um, it's just, you know, it's one of those things we tell the students, always uh, ride the downward crest of an epidemic and you'll get the credit for it, you know, uh, you, if you take the measures. But um, th those Victorian early public health people working 20 years before the germ theory of disease, mm -hmm. they were in a position where they would have to say, well, we don't really know what's going on here, but in the current state of knowledge, it might be prudent to do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's where you are. And, and the, the sort of things they did, what they did in Liverpool, was they did slum improvement, you know, 20 years before the germ theory of disease for the cholera. They used lime washing to wash down the, uh, the slum areas, which was an mm -hmm. antiseptic. Uh, and they instigated clearing the refuse and the rotting animal and vegetable matter from the streets. And it had an impact, but they didn't really know what, what why, why you know? exactly. but they were taking measures on a priori principles. And very often that's what you have to do in public health. 
Hey, yeah, exactly. And when you're in, in the early stages of a pandemic, you can't wait for a randomized control uh, double blind study and and p values that are super good. You have so th this is act, where right. It's where well, it's where we have science as religion. You know, um, the interesting thing again about this uh, this this book here. Mm -hmm. um, at the first couple of chapters, they're talking about the origin of Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Medical School in 1874. And until that time, there were no professors of medicine, hardly any professors of medicine, and no professors of public health in the United States. Um, the scientific base of public health was being developed in the UK and Germany and presumably in, in Scandinavia. But um, the, the, uh, the, the professors in the universities in America were all theologians at that time. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, Johns Hopkins was the first university to really try to put medicine on a scientific footing. And the, the laboratory work that they did, the early work they did on, on um, uh, vi virology, which played into the understanding of the 1918-19 pandemic, you know, was really science coming into its own. Uh, what was paradoxical about our situation in the UK here was that you had these people being put up saying, well, it's the science, it's the science, it's the science. And there's a distinct absence of common sense. And, they, and the, um, the scientists were being held up as though they were Old Testament prophets coming down from the mountain with the, with the, with the laws on, on tablets. And the, an unwillingness by government to say, well, actually, or by the scientists themselves, actually, to say, I'm afraid we don't really know. We, we, you know, there's a lot we don't know about this virus. There's a lot we don't know about what's happening. Right. And, and, and it's, it's really dangerous when people don't admit to ignorance or uncertainty. And of course, the problem with politicians is that they become very dangerous when they believe their own rhetoric, which it, they tend to do most of the time anyway. But to have them in the middle of an epidemic believing mm -hmm. their own rhetoric that's really dangerous so how what did you how do you think the united kingdom should have acted in the early days of the um, of the pandemic and you said you had the first case on 31st of january uh, that seemed to be traced the cases the new cases seemed to be traced pretty well at that stage what yeah, we had the first should the uk have done first quarantining was the 31st of January. The first cases were going into February. But yes, we started off doing the containing. I think the, the problem that's now become quite clear is we didn't have the capacity to do the contact tracing. Mm -hmm. And that's been a consequence of, of neglecting the public health system over the past 10 years uh, since the austerity agenda and big cuts in local government budgets and in the public health budgets so that the public health teams in the town halls mm -hmm. are now very small and they don't really have the manpower for doing the contact tracing over and above a you know, relatively small number of people. So, mm -hmm. But even within that, they didn't make use of manpower that was there. We have about 5,000 environmental health officers in the country who are used to investigating you know, food poisoning outbreaks at weddings mm -hmm. and in restaurants and things like that. So it's a similar methodology but they weren't asked to help um, because they, they're, they've been very weakened over the last decade or two, the environmental health profession as well. And the public health side in the UK has been highly centralized into this new organization from 2013 called Public Health England. They've centralized a lot of the expertise into London and the southeast of the country. Um, and this became important again as well when it came on to doing the lab side of the testing because mm -hmm. they were looking just to one set of labs at Northwick Park in North London to do all the tests. Whereas ever since the Second World War, we had a strong regional network of laboratories, but they really weren't brought into the picture uh, to, do, to do the testing. So we didn't have the capacity to do the testing. And the same issue was uh, true in the United States, I understand. In the early days, you were supposed to send all your samples to CDC, and it took like two weeks to get a response. Yeah, well, and this weekend that's just passed, 
the UK sent 50,000 specimens to the United States for the lab work. Oh, really? So anyway, what you're saying is uh, identify, right? Yeah. Diagnose, testing is crucial in the early stages. And, and, and that was limping. That was not very efficient. And no. contact tracing, right? Yeah, well, this is the, you know, the mantra that the director general of WHO was saying over and over again was test, test, test. But it, it was screen, test, um, contact trace, triage into, you know, no, clear, clear, clinical but negative, clinical and positive, right. sick. Uh, this is what we did in Bahrain. And Bahrain has only had eight deaths. Um, Wow. It's only a small country, but they've only had eight deaths. They had quite a problematic situation in as much as there were a large number of religious pilgrims coming and going to Iran, to the holy sites, and many of them were coming back positive. But mm -hmm. what they've done in, in uh, Bahrain is to triage them. They, it, very early on, they created a big camp, which is like a holiday camp uh, for 3,000 people with three sections in it. Uh, for people coming into the country so that people who had come in but just needed to be isolated for 14 days could go to one part. Uh, people who were um, testing uh, positive could go into another part uh, and people who, but, but didn't have any clinical signs. People who had clinical signs and were testing positive could go into the third part mm -hmm. and then if they became really poorly they could go to the infectious diseases uh, wards in the hospitals which they reorganized to take over more parts of the hospitals to be infectious disease wards and they've done really well and they they've they've, they've had some outbreaks uh, smallish outbreaks in the labor camps where they have all these overseas uh, workers from indonesia and malaysia there's a just just under a million workers who are in quite overcrowded poor accommodation mm -hmm. but yeah. they've been able to triage them segregate them isolate and quarantine them and prevent those outbreaks taking off they've done really well and they've also it's one of the things that's been good to see i i advised them that they needed to improve the standard of the housing for the migrant workers so they've been demolishing blocks and building new blocks for them as part of the public health response good so and then uh so uh, if we go back to the UK response then, and then there was a tendency for a while or a discussion that um, uh, there should be herd immunity coming out of this infection. And we, and basically that's what you heard from the United, K K United Kingdom for, for a week or two or something like that. Well, it was just a few days, actually. I think what was happened really? was, you know, you had this problem that we weren't doing many tests. Mm -hmm. You had the um, statistical modelers in London and Oxford and uh, at um, Imperial College with their models. Now, it doesn't matter how good the model is, if the data's weak going in, the conclusions are going to be weak coming out. And that was the problem that they had. Because, they, because we, we, you know, it's what the Americans used to say, garbage in, garbage out, gigo. If you remember <laughs> exactly. the early computer. True for all science, right? Yeah. So, you know, there was weak data going in. So mm -hmm. they underestimated the trajectory of the epidemic. And then they suddenly realized that actually it was following Italy very closely. The, the gradient was very similar to the Italian gradient. And it was then uh, that they came up with this story about, well, actually, we weren't really trying to contain it at all. Um, you know, herd immunity will do the trick. And, you know, that only lasted about three or four days because there was uproar here. Mm -hmm. People said this is unethical. You know, you're going to allow people to die who didn't need to die. It's a very instrumental approach to right. elderly people. Um, and um, and it, it really seemed to be a, like a cover story to account for failure, you know, that they'd come up with. So this is when, when we start coming close to comparing the UK response with the Swedish response. But after those few days, there were some uh, medical experts and public health individuals that really uh, told the government, this is, this is a no-go. 
right? Well, they did a 180 degree turn on the Monday or the Tuesday. I mean, that, that all took place over a weekend in the middle of March. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they did a 180 degree turn on that and said, we've got to suppress it now. Right. So they went, they went from contain to, um, to, to herd immunity to suppression mm-hmm. in the course of about a week. At least they changed their minds. Yeah, at least they changed their minds. But then they've been ambiguous about it anyway, because you had the prime minister saying, well, Mm -hmm. people shouldn't go to the pub, but it was okay for my dad to go to the pub, you know. Mm -hmm. His dad, not my dad. And he was still sick, right? Yeah. So so the pubs have been closed until, until now. Oh, the pubs are closed. Yeah, the pubs are closed. That's a big deal in the United Kingdom. Yeah, there's a lot of home drinking going on. <laughs> I guess. So what do you think about outdoors versus indoor exposures and spread? Well, I think that comes back to what I was saying about the um, European football match between Madrid and Liverpool. You know, there's, mm-hmm. uh, the exposure uh, is not just about um, the, the time you're sitting in a seat in the ground Mm-hmm. and how far the viral spread will be in the row in front, the row behind, the people on either side. It's, it's all the other things. It's the same thing with schools, of course, uh, because, you know, children have to come and go to school. They're, you've got the school gate. You've got parents at the school gate talking with each other. Uh, you know, there's other things going on. It's a total social experience. And I think what you've got is rather narrow biological scientists Mm-hmm. thinking in terms of, um, you know, the contagion rather than thinking the social uh, context. Yeah, the R0, uh, R0, uh, the spread, the is dependent on behavior quite extensively. Yeah. That's what you're saying. And, and what, that's what the point I was going to make before about this report yesterday. There's one of the poll recommendations is, a, is about behavioral sh- uh, shaping and habit forming. Uh, and the science of of forming new habits, mm-hmm. which is very interesting, you know, because it can take quite some time to really establish new habits at a population level. So now, uh, now the UK are beginning to open up a little bit, and you should still work from home if you can work from home, but you can go to work as well, right? But ideally, not going through the subway, and I, it's it's a bit vague. Uh, it's, when I read it, than, it seems way vague, right? But it's more than vague. It's it's everybody's totally confused, right? Uh, and if you go on social media, you'll see a lot of cartoons that people have posted about, you know, the fact is, you know, you could go to work if you can't work at home, but you can only work at home, or you can only go there, and you can only do this, and you can only do that, but you can't do that if you do this, and you can't. Nobody knows what to do. Um, mm-hmm. And then on the on the social media this morning, you'll see. The underground trains in London are packed and only some people are wearing masks. I mean, they, you know, and um, that we've got the a biological bomb. Yeah, it's horrendous. And then we've got the story coming out this week, the last two days, that um, the death rates among particular categories of worker are much higher. So you're talking about um, security guards. You're talking about bus drivers, you talk about taxi drivers, they've got much higher death rates than the general population. So uh, you've got the professor from the London School of Hygiene yesterday saying, uh, this virus is, is an occupational disease. Um, you know, we, we know that frontline health workers are particularly at risk, mm-hmm. but it's also other frontline workers, uh, which brings them in face-to-face contact with people. And these are poorer people um, on lower pay, and you've got an accumulation of other risk factors, personal risk factors, probably smoking, possibly being obese, um, living in overcrowded accommodation, and then in a face-to-face work environment. So this big social inequality issue is now being brought to the top. Yeah, so we, we had similar uh, extensive spread in, in some areas where there were a lot of uh, uh, immigrants living uh, outside of Stock- Stockholm, especially a lot, my, many of the first deaths were among people uh, living under those sort of circumstances. Not 
perhaps listening to the same degree to to the information and the information wasn't conveyed in their language exactly uh, the mother tongue so that was also a little bit of an of an issue so now you have ambiguity and nobody really knows what to do and that's no. not good either right well it means that the solidarity is fraying mm -hmm. um and you know this comes back again to the fact that the government has not been open and transparent about the information and the information's been poor anyway and that the people who've been organizing the daily press conferences for the last month or so are the same political advisors from Australia who advised the government on its election campaign when the Conservative Party was elected in the autumn. I mean, so it's, it's been reducing it to slogans, political kinds of slogans, mm -hmm. uh, and there's no nuance uh, in the messaging. Um, and you, you've got to, if, if you look at the documents for pandemic planning, whether they're our domestic ones from the UK government or uh, when, when you can get ones that are up to date because a lot of them are out of date, but the WHO ones, they all say open and transparent communication and full public engagement is essential. That's what they documents say. And we didn't do that. Uh, and if you, you know, what I've been saying throughout this is the government's treating the public like children um, instead of treating like adults. If you treat people like children, don't be surprised if they behave like delinquents, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so when it comes to breaking the rules about staying at home, you've got the younger people who are being, um, you know, particularly, it's understandable to an extent, you know, people in their teens, 20s, they want to be out, they want to be with their boyfriends, with their girlfriends, they mm -hmm. want to be socialising, they need intimacy. Um, you know, and, and they, they've been led to believe that, that it's not going to affect them anyway, because this is, they're led to believe this is a virus of older people. Although, mm. you know, this virus may change, it has affected some younger people. Uh, so they're the ones that really are problematic. Um, there's three groups of problematic, actually. Um, that's one group. Uh, religious uh, communities is a second group. Uh, there have been issues with um, different faith communities who found it very difficult not to continue to congregate in church or in the mosque or in the synagogue. Um, and they, you know, around the world there have been stories of outbreaks in faith communities um, because of that. Um, and then the I third mean, the famous group, one was in South Korea, right? Yeah, exactly. Where, the third where they group, had this, yeah. Uh, which I, again is something I realized in um, when I was in Bahrain is VIPs. VIPs think that they're immune from everything um, and they'll break the rules and they, you know, they go skiing and come back and not self isolate and they'll do all sorts of things. So we saw it with the prime minister himself in the Eng England. He thought, you know, he's lived a charmed life. You know, why can the virus possibly affect me? You know, and you've seen quite a lot of cases of celebrities. And he was pretty sick. He got pretty sick. Yeah, well, we're, we're not sure about that. But it, anyway, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of celebrities have been uh, vulnerable here where they think that they can just buy the way out of trouble. And, um, you know, that's been brought home. So that's an issue as well. One of the famous things over the last week or so was when the vice president of the united states pence went to i think it was mayo clinic and it was r mandatory to wear a mask at the mayo clinic so everybody wore a mask except pence exactly well and we've also just... we've also had several instances here of um you know highly paid footballers having sexual orgies with sex workers in the hotels you know oh goodness all right yeah so I, I think so. We're still we're still in a situation in both the United Kingdom and in Sweden, thinking about how to move forward. But before we go there, I really like to discuss that as well. How do we? How can we? How can we stabilize our lives over the next uh, six months and three years? Mm. But um, your views on the response in Sweden? I'm really curious to hear what you think about the <clears throat> attitude of the Swedish. Um, strategy let's put it that way well I, I don't know 
the details, you know, I mean, I've, I've read a bit and I've seen a program about it. And it seemed to me that you seem to have adopted a kind of soft version of the herd immunity. But at the same time, um, there's been a kind of voluntary lockdown or a voluntary self-isolation mm -hmm. of many people. And you know, I think this is where it becomes a bit subtle because different countries have different cultures. And I think that the Swedish culture, from what I know of it, and I've been quite a lot of times in, in my life to Sweden, um, is quite a conformist country. I mean, it really is quite, quite a, good at following rules and doing what you're told and stuff like that, whereas the British culture is more anarchistic. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, that's a, a bit more problematic. So it may be that one doesn't have to be so dogmatic about things for, for the Swedish to do the right thing. Ironically, yesterday, our prime minister in England was saying, it's all about common sense, you know. Um, but unfortunately, as we always say, common sense is the least common sense. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, so that's an issue. So um, my understanding is you've also had quite a lot of deaths in care homes. And, um, yes. And that's an issue. And you have quite large care homes, which is a bit of a surprise to me because... I thought that they were smaller than some of ours, but um, because as some, some of the early modeling before the epidemic here mm -hmm. indicated that if you got a case in a care home, you might expect 30% of the residents to go down with the virus. That was in some of the planning documents. Um, and half of them passing away, based on yeah. that. So we're seeing that now. I mean, that's, that's what's going on. Um, but I thought, um, you know, it was quite a dangerous line for Sweden to take. And my understanding is your numbers have, um, have been catching up and they're not so dissimilar as rates per 100,000 to the British now. No, we were definitely higher than the United States per million of people. And we're not as high as Belgium. Belgium seems to be hit very hard. Yeah. Um, I haven't really studied Belgium yet, but we're so much higher then Finland, Denmark, and Norway are the closest neighbors that have had a totally different approach, had a uh, close down of hairdressers and things like that, right? You could go and shop, uh, but you need to be, be very, very careful. So we are a number of uh, scientists, that, very serious scientists that are very, very, very critical about the Swedish uh, strategy. Because one of the most important things, in my view, is that we need to postpone the spread of this virus, postpone the infection in as many people as possible because we will get new medicines. We are already getting new medicines that are looking quite good. Uh, and we'll, we are um, really finding new vaccines coming, coming very, very soon as well. I mean, it might take a while to get them actually distributed because we're not going to you know, uh, vaccinate a million people this time. We're going to be vaccinating billions of people we're going to need multiple types of vaccine but postponing the deaths and postponing the spread is so important to to save lives no i i totally agree and, I, and I, all through this i've said what government should be thinking about is three months six months nine months mm -hmm. you know nothing's going to come on you know the the good cowboys aren't going to come over the hill until the new year you yeah. know and we've got to manage it till then. Now, part of that is you can't do anything to ease off, in my view, until you've got very large scale testing and contact tracing. And you in the meantime, you have to continue to protect your vulnerable groups. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I've been saying here is that if we could allow the younger workforce to be able to continue to work, then they could do that if they didn't sleep under the same roof as people who are vulnerable. So they should be in hotels and guest houses and school dormitories and university halls and places like that. They could all be there, but then they should be tested every week. So you could right. let them get on with their lives. They could have their romantic lives and everything, um, but they would have to be separate from People like myself, I'm 72, I've got type 2 diabetes. Um, you know, they need to be separate from us. They should just get on with their life, help the economy and so on, but they need to be living separately and they need to be tested every week. 
So, you know, that, right. that, that should be possible. That, that's, that's one way of doing it. And, and but the issue is these people are, I mean, my daughter is 25 years old. She works in elderly people's homes when, when she's not studying or when she has a weekend off so from her studies. So end of the day, those between 20 and 40 are, are helping our elderly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a risk, right? So, so they've got to be properly protected. Right, that, that, that comes to the protection, right? The mouthpieces yeah. and the protection in the workplace yeah. that is uh, really, really, really important. So, And that's been a disaster. I don't know whether you've seen this. What happened here was that in March, the uh, advisors to the British government took a decision to reclassify the COVID-19 virus from being the highest uh, rate of danger to the second highest rate of danger um, and that meant that they could then re-allocate uh, it to mean you didn't need the full range of PPE, of personal protective equipment. And that seems to have been because we didn't have it. We didn't have enough personal protective equipment. So this was political-led science, not science-led politics. We had the same issue. You know, we had, we had millions and millions of face masks uh, stored uh, just in case until... A number of years ago when they were destroyed because it just cost money being stored yeah um whereas our neighboring country finland for example were prepared 100 percent prepared yeah and and could could implement that so you're coming back to to testing and tracing testing and tracing isolating right and and now we're talking about about um personal protection right so if you go to china today which you're not allowed to probably because from the uk everybody mm. every everybody outside of their homes or in the subway wear masks yeah should we do, do the same should we do Are the they same do? you doing that no 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 yeah. i do personally because yeah. i want to do what i think is right right yeah but the other thing is you know what they do in china they they have um if you're going to the supermarket you have your temperature taken at the door. Mm. Um, the children going to school, they have the temperature taken, they have to be screened, uh, they have to change their face mask for a new one. Mm. They, they, there's a nice little film on, on uh, YouTube of, of the children going in. They have to go through about five stations to get into the school uh, before they're allowed in of the things they have to do, which is really top level personal uh, hygiene stuff, you know. Um, they they do all this. Yes. Uh, so so, are you? Uh, do you think mouth protection, face protection, in public spaces by the public is is a is a good way forward? I think it's it's an essential part of the overall story. I mean, it, you, you know, we all know when we sneeze what happens, or when we cough, and mm -hmm. it's 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 not going to. It's, it's very unlikely to protect you against infection, but this is about protecting other people. Um, my wife is very interested in the cultural side of this and about, you know, the, the Japanese uh, approach. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, in, we were in Japan last year for holidays, actually. It is considered extremely rude in Japan to cough or sneeze in public. Extremely rude. It's a cultural matter. Of, uh, of etiquette mm -hmm. and of personal behavior. And so uh, the face mask is part of that. It's part of a cultural etiquette mm -hmm. of politeness. I think in Europe, we tend to see it more about um, hygiene and, um, and, you know, and somehow it's stigmatizing. If you're, and I notice, because I wear a mask when I go to the shops here, when I be, went yesterday, I will, I've got a good mask, not a, not a 95 surgical yeah. one, but it's quite a good one. Uh, and people tend to stay even further away from me than the two meters because they must think I might have it or something like that. It's very strange. Um, but, you know, there's something stigmatizing about wearing a mask in a European context. And I think we've also been quite kind of racist about the Chinese and the Japanese wearing masks. When you see them in London, uh, out on the street, you know, wearing them, um, possibly because of the air pollution or something like that, but they, mm -hmm. you know, they they were them in lots of different settings. 
So how do we um, move forward? It's got to be um, getting the testing up, getting the tracing up. Uh, it's, it's about protecting our frontline workers, whether they're clinical workers or whether they are in human services jobs. Uh, it, all of that's got to be done before we can let anything down. Mm -hmm. I think um, there are other aspects to this which you may wish to touch on. I think that um, the, the way in which countries, many countries have become complacent about their public health systems is something which has to be flagged up here. We need to invest properly in resilient public health systems. And that, part of that means that the medical schools and the other universities that are involved in training health workers and social workers need to take public health more seriously. And, you know, it's, it's common experience that people going into public health uh, are regarded by um, medics in other areas as somehow failures not to have gone into cardiology or endocrinology or something like that. You know, this is a second rate surgery. choice of career. Right. Uh, and the, the amount of curriculum time given over to public health is not great. Uh, but actually, everybody needs to be literate in public health whatever they're doing mm -hmm. in the world of medicine and healthcare they need to be literate in public health and i think this this uh, pandemic's demonstrated that so i think every country needs to review its public health arrangements after this um also uh, th there needs to be a lot of writing going on of the experience uh, for the future mm -hmm. um I, i've been encouraging uh, i have about thirty-five thousand followers on my twitter accounts i've been That's encouraging I have been, i've been encouraging everybody to keep diaries you know yeah um during the second world war when britain was being extensively bombed uh, we had an initiative called mass obs mass observations mm -hmm. where people were encouraged to keep diaries and the government actually employed people to go and sit in pubs and listen to conversations and all sorts of things which was about gauging morale and uh, finding out what was going on at large now mm -hmm. mass obs have revived their data collection during this in, in the UK. If you Google mass observations, you'll find it very interesting. But there's, there's learning to be had from this for the future and for future preparation. So wherever you are in the system, it's important to capture this uh, for um, reflective learning and for writing papers and for educational inputs. So these are other thoughts. Were you prepared for a pandemic like this? Personally. Personally. I think as, as a public health director for many years, I'd been involved in other outbreaks and I'd been involved in many exercises, um, not just uh, infectious disease exercises, but terrorism exercises and other kinds of exercises. And I've always been very um, keen to be on top of this. When I was regional medical officer and regional director of public health for the northwest of England, I made sure this was one of my top priorities. Part of the reason for that was I was involved personally in the Hillsborough football disaster. Um, and right. uh, when there was a total whole system failure of the emergency response. And, uh, and where it was quite clear that the health services were not fully engaged in emergency planning. So, you know, I, I personally take this very seriously. And in fact, when we had the swine flu in the UK in 2009, uh, there was a report done on that the uh, Deirdre Hine, uh, mm -hmm. Dame Deirdre Hine, who was a public health um, director herself. Uh, she, she had been chief medical officer for Wales, but she did the report. And it was a very positive report about how we'd done for the swine flu. And then the, at the very end of the Blair government, uh, the Secretary of State for Health invested uh, 500 million pounds in stocks of uh, equipment and everything uh, for disaster preparedness. But during the last 10 years, we took our eye off the ball mm -hmm. and uh, we allowed the, uh, the planning documents to expire. We allowed the stocks of kit to, to be um, run down. We had a major exercise in 2016, which identified uh, called Operation Cigna, which operate, which identified lots of weaknesses, and nothing happened to the report. Um, it seems as though it finished up in the shadow 
of all the Brexit stuff. All yeah, the, all the Brexit conversation. Yeah. Pardon? You were busy with that. Yeah. But the country was busy with that. And it, but it's interesting because, you know, if you read The Great Influenza about the 1918-19, mm-hmm. the Americans had the same problem uh, because the American president uh, was so focused on getting America into the First World War. That took total attention span in America. And meanwhile, the uh, pandemic was starting in the military camps in America where they had hundreds of thousands of troops getting ready to come to Europe and where the, the uh, influenza started and the American government just w- ignored it uh, because they had their attention on something else, which is an interesting observation about the importance of scanning what's going mm-hmm. on. Uh, I know you used to have in Sweden, maybe you still have an Institute for Future Studies in, in Gothenburg, I think. Um, I'm sure there is definitely, yes. Yeah, I, I, I visited it about 30 or 35 years ago. Uh, uh, Göran Dahlgren uh, was the head of it. Uh, but um, having a place that's actually looking to the future, scanning, seeing mm-hmm. what's coming, seeing what you know risks are, this should be bread and butter to a government. So I can confess that I, I've been thinking about the possibility of a pandemic like this since I went to medical school in the, in the 80s. Because uh, I learned yes. some time then. And then we had the SARS uh, 2003 issue. And that sort of made me very aware. Now, uh, and then we had 2009 as well, which was a bit, sc- in 2012 when MERS, that were a bit scary. So I, I, I've been actually very prepared and thinking that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yes, exactly. And, and so, in, among my colleagues in public health, mm-hmm. you know, we always talked about this, about when the big one would come. Mm-hmm. You know, with, when the big one would come. In January, I, I went to a shop for Chinese food and bought a 25 kilogram sack of rice just to be sure that if there was a lack of distribution of food, we could survive for a, for a month or so. But, you know, the distribution of food is working very well, and which is... Many of the functions of society are still working very well. And, and that, uh, I think, is, is exceptionally important in a situation like this. Like internet. Can you imagine the situation without the internet? No, it's amazing. It's amazing. But you see, you raise the issue about food security. I mean, one of the main drivers behind the establishment of the European community originally was about food security because of what happened during the Second World War. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my uncle, um, who's also was John Ashton, was the first agricultural economist in the UK. And he was a government advisor to Edward Heath when he was prime minister and involved in negotiations for Britain entering the European Union. So our family have very strong commitment to the European Union, you know, you can imagine. <laughs> but but yeah, that was all about, it was all about food security. Right. And, you know, one worries now for the future with the UK about how we can depend because about 50% of our food in the UK comes from outside the UK. And, and th- those relationships with the European Union are very important. Um, so we don't know what the future holds with that. You know, we, we, it's important, right? I think in Sweden, the only, there are a few different food items that we, can, we get from our own country, like potato or something, yeah. potatoes or something. Yeah, but that's about... There are a lot of foods that they, come from they, abroad. Are they kartoffels? Yeah, kartoffel. <laughs> That's German. Uh, potatoes in Swedish, yes, exactly. No, I, I, I speak a bit of Danish, and when I'm in Sweden, they say, why do you keep speaking Danish? <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, I, I think this was, uh, this was really an enjoyable dialogue. Thank you so much, John. It's, uh, it was a pleasure, and uh, I don't know if we have a solution for the future, but Testing, tracing, yeah. Yeah. isolating, protecting yeah. yourself, protecting your elderly as much as you humanly can. And maybe we can open borders, maybe we can open shops, and maybe we can have a functional society sooner than we think if, we just, if we're just diligent. I think for me, you know, who has a range of young people in the family, mm-hmm. uh, enabling our young people to get on with their lives is also a priority And I think we need to see how we can do that without compromising biosecurity. 
that'll be the end word of this dialogue. Thank you so much, John. It was a great pleasure. And uh, I hope to have this discussion again in a year when hopefully we have a vaccine and a therapy and yeah, discuss. Yeah, that would be nice. Work. That would be Thank nice. Thank you so much. I'll stop give the recording. My, give my love to Sweden. Thank you.